you carry my ticket. <laughs> and I unfortunately was unable to attend the workshop that was in Enniskillen, so I had nothing of my own done. So as Joanne says, I'm going to read one of Phyllis Kenny's poems called Eamon Rowe. Uh, this poem, Eamon Rowe, was written about his cousin, <coughs> which, which was a man called Jim Kearney, and he was shot in Pettigrew. If you happen to be going down for cheap diesel and you see a monument, <laughs> and just stop at the monument and creep along and you see a sign, Jim Kearney, and this poem was written about Jim Kearney. Thank you very much. I was young when first I met him. He is dead and I am old. I never will forget him for the stories that he told. When we roamed her own together in the sunshine or the snow, faith, we didn't mind the weather, did myself and him in Rome. He was long and lean and wiry, not an inch of flesh to spare. And his temper was as fiery as a moth's mop of flaming hair. He could chant a reel and sing a song and set the heart aglow. Oh, I never did a wolf, oh, he never did a wolf for wrong, bold, reckless, even wrong. I gained the time and always will before the troubled years. When he and I went out to drill with Redmond's volunteers, we marched and sloped our wooden guns and made a gallant show. We changed them yet for better ones. Please God, said him in Rome. 1914, the German threat, and him and went, uh, and England went to war. We can't leave Belgium to her fifth, the cry ran near and far. I joined the English army, then but Eamon wouldn't go. There's cleaner work for Irish men at home, said Eamon Rome. I weathered through the battle storm, but God I wouldn't brag. I wore an English uniform and fought for England's flag. But when I should have been in Ireland to strike a true man's blow, or roam the hills a hunted man along with him and Rome. For him and took the patriot way of, the, of, of little Ray Compans. How dare you Spanglers sure say that boy had little sense. He fought for slaves like you and I and fell at Paddy Go. I wish I had been there today beside you, even Rome. I'm old and now for certain that what God, ord God ordains must be I also know that Eamon was a better man than me. And I cannot help but think that when I, when it comes his time to go, that God will pardon Judas. Wasn't hard on Eamon Rowe. <laughs> Um, we now have Philem O'Neill again for Philem uh, introduce your poem. I will indeed. <coughs> 1916 was a very important year for all of Ireland. Um, and this poem is uh, entitled Stonebreaker's Yard. The ravens flap and fill the sky with futile call and plaintive of cry. They spread their ragged wings and fly beyond the bleak stone walls. The cobbles in the yard below have felt the feet of friend and foe, <coughs> and witnessed to the bloody flow unloosed by martial laws. The early morning Dublin breeze saw men in groups of twos and threes, made subject to a court's decrees, 
and stood against those stones. As fusillades of shots rang out, the startled ravens wheeled about, and citizens who stood without said prayers in somber tones. A hundred years have come and gone since fifteen men were shot at dawn, and still the issues lingered on, and still we count the cost. Within the bare stonebreaker's yard, the sturdy gates are closed and barred, and ravens strut in stately guard around the wooden cross. This simple edifice proclaims the death of Irish men whose names have entered Ireland's Hall of Fame as founders of their nation. The cobbled yard bears witness to the final moments that they knew, as dawn's first gleamings grew and grew in hopeful consolation. Thank you. is um, Feeney Glass, who is going to read actually uh, two poems that go together called No Man's Land. This is two parts. One first poem is a poem and the second one is a short monologue. No Man's Land, one. I'm lying here calling, but no one comes near me. Maybe nobody hears me. That's Tommy close by me, upside down in the mud. I call him for help, and he would if he could. We came here together to slaughter the hum. We said we would fight them all till the very last one. I'm lying here calling, but no one comes near me. Maybe nobody hears me. That's wee Johnny Nugent lying out by me. His eyes are shut tight. He's surely not sleeping. Get up, Geordie, and fight. <coughs> I'm lying here calling, but no one comes near me. Maybe nobody hears me. That's Sergeant McGillian. We call him Booty for short. He could be a bit crabbit, but not a bad sort. His clean boots are shining. Oh my God, where are his legs? I'm lying here calling, but no one comes near me. Maybe nobody hears me. The guns are all quiet. There's blue in the sky. My friends all dead around me. Is it my turn to die? And I'm here calling and calling and calling. Then I hear Mommy saying, Is that you calling me, son? No man's love, too. They call us the body snatchers. We collect the dead from the battlefields. <clears throat> After the battles, we can hear cries for help. But by the time we get to them, it's too late. Some of them are still switching as life leaves them. We gather them up. In some cases, we have to dig them out, lifting the place, pieces we can identify. Legs, arms, feet. Heads are the worst. The helmet protects the skull, but the face is blown away, exposing the jaw and the baby teeth that have not grown down. We have cudgels for the rats, some as big as cats. When they refuse to give up their feast, we beat them like savages. There are days I pretend they're the enemy, other days they're the generals, sitting in their comfortable high, clean billets, drinking wine while the red blood of young men flows freely through the mud. We do our best to match up the bodies, but how can you match up a pair of boots with feet, the feet still in them, or three fingers wrapped around the trigger of a twisted gun? Their war is over now. We will do the same again tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jimmy. As Our last writer um, to present will be John Monaghan. Uh, from Fermanagh, and uh, that will be our last in this session, and we will move back to the library. Um, so, John, let you introduce. Okay. Um, this is a poem. Uh, I called it The Truths I Couldn't Tell. The reason for it is that what I, I was at the workshop that Paddy mentioned in, 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 in July, and um, we were given various objects that we could look at, but being writers, actually, what we chose was a letter. And the letter is pretending that everything's pretty okay, you know, we're having a great time here and all that. 
Um, and I thought, what if a soldier from that time wrote a letter and told the truth as, as much as he could as he saw it? So I called it the truth I couldn't tell. I have no words to tell you about the squalor and the smell. No letter I could ever write can describe this man-made hell. I have no words to tell you what it's like to see no grass, nor words to paint a picture of our dreadful fear of gas. I have no words to tell you how our nerve ends all scream stop when we stare out at no man's land, and yet we go on over the top. And I have no words to tell you how it feels to see a mate get stuck in the mud and injured and must leave him to his fate. But I have the words to tell you, whether British, Hun or French, when this cursed war is over, I'll not set a foot in any trench. Okay.